And don't be shy. You guys can either unmute and just ask. That's my preferred way. Um, but if you want to throw it in the chat, I can take a, a look at the chat as well. And I can pick on a couple of my friends if nobody wants to be the first one with a question. Alan, I can ask Mike. Yeah, that's right. Mike, I volunteer Mike. No. I volunteer Mike too as tribute. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I actually do have a question if you want to speak to this. Is Yeah, uh, absolutely. One of the things that I noticed that uh, Optum did where I work early on when they started, you know, thinking about Agile and Scrum was they said, hiring Agile must have five years experience as project manager. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. Isn't those different, right? And I can see the value of a company doing that because it's like, how do you hire people for a new experience when there's no previous experience, right? But can you speak to a little bit of maybe about how companies have made that transition from uh, project management to uh, Scrum? Absolutely. Um, so some organizations uh, honestly don't know right? So you, we kind of got to give them the benefit of the doubt, or we have to ask more questions to get to the root cause of what they mean. But there are some who say, okay, we've been working with project management for so many years. If somebody's going to help us transition from that, they might need to play translator, right? They might need to speak to both sides. Because there are some friends of mine in the Agile and Scrum community who will brag about I never worked in project management. I was never a project manager. And I've watched a couple of them just kind of crash and burn when questions come up from dyed in the wool PMPs or, or people who aren't trying to challenge them or they're not trying to, you know, get cute and asking the question. It's just that because they worked that other way so long, that's the lens they're looking through. That's, that's the frame of reference they're looking through. And so I've watched colleagues of mine unable to perform that translation. So for organizations who have the realization, hey, this isn't gonna happen overnight. This isn't easy. We're talking about structural change and behavioral change. So we need somebody who not only has walked in those shoes, who understands the project way of working and then can take us to this new way. Um, all the while, of course, pointing out, right, here's, here's the change, here's the, uh, the consequences if you don't change, here's the consequences if you do, right, here's, here's what's going to happen. So I do see that. The other thing I see is sometimes it's a talent acquisition or recruiter who just doesn't know. You know, their boss said, hey, get somebody in here who knows that agile stuff. Uh, uh. I don't know how to write one of those requisitions. So I'm going to grab this old project requisition and I'm going to put the word agile in front of it, or I'm going to put some agile stuff at the bottom. Cause I see that a lot too. So it could be one of any of those scenarios. So I like to probe a little bit and ask some questions about it till I figure out what the case really is. Did that help Alan? Did that go too wide with where you were headed? Oh, that was great. Thank you. Yep. So, Angela, uh, this is uh, Dennis Stevenson here. Um, I am one of those recruiters. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> you. I love people like you. Because when I actually get to talk to people like you, I'm like, let me help, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> you, so uh, I, I have a question. So I, I kind of joined a little late. Um, so I didn't see your presentation, actually, you know, from the start. We're, Alan's uh, recording it. It's okay. But um, I just want to... I know you really talked about the difference between a project manager and, and someone who's, who's uh, you know, does the scroll and stuff. Uh, so <clears throat> would it be fair to say that um, a scrum couldn't do project management work or or a project management manager could do scrum work or, I mean, yeah, it's can a great one, just, one just switch over or? I mean, and then project management, and then, then just a follow-up question with that too is, uh, so project management usually has some type of degree that's associated with it. Where does Scrum have that, or is that just a certification? Some kind of, oh, degrees, you said, degree. uh, certification, yeah. yeah. It's really just the certifications. So, so let me tackle the first part first, and then I'll get to your follow-up one. Um, the first part's a great question, because there is no one-for-one correlation between the scrum team roles and project management roles. And, and a lot of organizations, you know, so you, thank you for telling me that you're in a recruiting function because I, I, I want to help you do your job better. Um, so it's really about 
the candidate. It's really about the person. So I always ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? Because not every project manager makes a good scrum master. They just don't. Because scrum masters need people skills. They need people skills, people skills. Oh yeah, more people skills. There are zero deliverables for a scrum master. It is not administrative at all. Now, if I think back to my project management days, oh my gosh, process charts, reports, Gantt charts, take the notes, be the scribe. It's all administrative. It's, it's very, very secretarial. Um, and I was always that kind of project manager that latched onto the people part. I would you know, throw people in a room or get people on a call, uh, just try to make people talk to each other. So when I learned what a scrum master was, I happily kissed Microsoft Project goodbye. I tell my students I have not touched a project plan in 15 years and it's okay. Work still gets done. I'm a people geek. My, my forte is scrum mastery. It's helping people work together, being their neutral facilitator, being their coach, sometimes being the bouncer, sometimes being the referee, but it is not administrative because we're not into learned helplessness with Scrum. You know, organizations say they want accountability. They say they want, they want higher accountables. Well, then stop giving them adult daycare providers. <laughs> they have to do their own work, right? They have to manage their own work and they have to do their own work. So then the credentialing part. So the popular one with project managers, as I confessed, so you missed my confession at the beginning, Dennis, I have a PMP, project management professional. It's almost unfair to compare that credential to the one Mike just got to the CSM, the Certified Scrum Master, because the PMP credential not only has uh, project management candidates uh, learn the project management body of knowledge, which is hundreds of pages long, they have to take a four hour test that is 200 questions. Oh, look at Mike looking for his pin box. Show, can you turn it on its side so we can see how thick it is? Then I can tell them that the scrum guide's only 14 pages and really blow their mind. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's the body of knowledge <laughs> we had to study for the PMP. <laughs> um, and the, the scrum guide is free and it's only like that mm -hmm. thick. It's like 14 pages. Um, the PMP also required work experience. They wanted two years of work history to be able to even qualify to sit down and take the test. So Mike just came to my certified scrum master and I always tell people this, the CSM is the opposite because it's your driver's license. You guys remember drivers uh, taking your driver's test? Anybody besides me fail it the first time? Yeah, the, the seat flew back and the instructor went flying because the seat wasn't latched. Yeah, don't borrow the grandparent's car if you don't know all those things. Um, so for driving, you take a little behind the wheel, you take a quiz, and boom, here's your license. You're permitted on our streets. Go get better at it. That's the CSM. You take, you know, two days of training with a licensed instructor who doesn't have a safety break. Um, you take an online quiz. You're permitted on the streets. So the, the premise is very much in line with the values that we teach in Scrum. We know you're going to get better by getting out there and doing it. And so the CSM is entry level. Whereas the PMP from the project world expects some work history. And it's not that we don't have um, higher level credentials. There's an ACSM, which one of your members, Troy Temple has, because uh, I helped him get his CSM. And then after he had 12 months of work history under his belt, he came back and got the advanced and the CSP and whatnot. So there are practitioner level ones too, Dennis. The CSM is the, the starter, is the, the entry level. Mm -hmm. Did that answer both? questions because you gave me two. Yes, yes. I think you did answer the question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I truly, I, I truly didn't didn't know the difference, you know. Um, That's why I'm here. That's what I'm here for. So. Yeah. That's Happy good. Thank you. Answer questions. Angela, this is Greg. I have a question. Yep. Uh, what kind of projects have you done that have nothing to do with IT oh, or God. Um, software <laughs> implementation? <laughs> So do you mean in my scrummy career or pre-scrum yes. when it was actually, okay. Cause in my scrummy career, I got, I got more and they're cooler. Um, Novatech engineering, which is one of my favorite clients out in Wilmer, Minnesota. And they know 
uh, I talk about them. Um, they make robotic devices that get okay. used in poultry hatcheries. So okay. like duck hatcheries, chicken hatcheries. I, I won't turn you all into vegans in talking about what right. the devices okay. do. But Greg, that's uh, firmware, hardware, mechanical engineering, right? That very little to do with, you know, classic software. Okay. I, I asked because I have a PMP and I actually have a post on my website, an article. I have a PMP, but I'm not a PMP because having a PMP, I was, I think was, and I, I'm current. It's, it's, I think it's a good management tool because it, gives some science to the art of management because whatever you're doing, um, it lets you think about the parameters, cost, quality, uh, performance, schedule, et cetera. But because it's also a curse, because I have the PMP, I get calls from recruiters that, oh, PMP, Agile, Scrum, software development. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm not one of those guys, leave me alone. Yeah, I get it. Dennis is laughing. Has Dennis ever called you? Because <laughs> he got no, your PMP. No. Okay, good. <laughs> no. It, yeah, I get these calls Yeah, all the time, and it drives me nuts. I'm almost going to take my PMP off my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. And actually, I talked to someone the other day who was a project manager who told me that companies are, she said, companies are, um, she worked for a big company in the Twin Cities um, doing... Um, project management, she, and she said, from her experience, she told me that some companies are starting to shy away from hiring PMPs because so many of the, because they come in with that, you know, with, with that uh, software development background, which is, and, and they don't speak the language of the business. True. I agree. Because if you look at the numbers that Project Management Institute as an organization has shared, they shared that, and this was even pre-COVID, it was the beginning of 2020, that their um, numbers were down, mm -hmm. people seeking the, the PMP. And um, for those who may not know, um, I'm going to just write down an acronym here. Okay. SDLC might be another way that you hear project management referred to, SDLC, yeah. which stands for Software Development right. Lifecycle. Yeah. sometimes system development life cycle and all the roots of this or classic project management yeah. are rooted in government contracting specifically for software. Mm -hmm. Sure. So totally. I see where you would get stuck with that, um, yeah. that assumption. Yeah. That, that you somehow are looking for software jobs. Yeah. Just a comment. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then uh, you mentioned other ones uh, just because you said large company in the Twin Cities. And of course, my brain goes to 3M, who's also a client. But uh, I had a lot of fun working with two of their divisions that have nothing to do with software. Abrasives, mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then traffic and safety, of course. Okay. Right? <laughs> sure. Mike, you were chiming in there. I saw you going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what a question on transition for veterans, especially coming out of a very military background of kind of structured hierarchical back background. And Angela, you could even see it when we were talking about Scrum last week and me trying to get my mind off, you know, around it. And for everybody else, my background was modeling and simulations and defense acquisition. So defense acquisition is like super waterfall on, on steroids uh, uh, times 10. Um, so what have been some of those difficult points that you've seen working with veterans in getting their mind around uh, agile scrum and, and just that change of, of, of mindset or methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because I have talked to a lot of your members and a lot of veterans, which um, I will just throw this out to the group. Uh, Alan knows this, Mike knows this. If any of you even are looking to have a call that has nothing to do, you know, with a getting into a class or whatever, you just want somebody to, to bounce this off of. I have never said no to, you know, giving my time to do that. I do let people know I'm biased <laughs> because I've made my choice, but I speak PMP, I speak PMI, I can help, you know, translate that with that stuff. But it's the opposite, Mike. I see veterans actually having a pretty 
easy time acclimating to the value side of Scrum and Agile, especially when we talk about things like teamwork, servant leadership, order, right? Like there's, it all can't be priority or nothing is right. You know, those are the things I see people kind of go, oh, I get this. Like, oh yeah, I've got experience in this where they might struggle is if they have bought into some of the, the contracting side, uh, because like I said, this all comes from government contracting and then have, see, he smiles when I say that, because he knows it's true. So, <laughs> and so if we've worked too many years in that sequential linear all or nothing handoff fashion, sometimes that waterfall hangover that I call it is really strong. And then it's just a little bit of reminding like to let that go or to embrace the new way of working. Sure. As a follow-up, have you heard anything from employers talking about um, their experiences working with vets in, in an agile environment? I have. And one of the consistent themes there is the teamwork aspect and understanding team. Whereas some people who don't have that experience or that background, it's really easy to fall into the corporate ladder trap or the army of one, me, me, me. You know, and it's like, no, no, we're talking we here. There's a, there, there's a team here. And they like that, that that doesn't need to be explained, right? That part uh, is a consistent theme I hear. That's Thank a good you. question. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, veterans I talked to who lives in Washington state, I'm not sure if he's a member of your group, but uh, it was a referral from somebody in this uh, Midwestern part of the, the country. Um, he said he wasn't sure what to do in, in leaving uh, the service and he wanted to capitalize on some of those people skills. So he went into law enforcement and they put him through crisis intervention training. And he was talking to me about that. And I'm like, you're a natural scrum master, my friend. If you, if you got that kind of training, somebody will snap you up. Cause you know, a lot of the people stuff is what you're gonna run into. And, and the, the reason for that is that when Mike was uh, describing the classic waterfall, you know, and we all make the, the picture with our hands or, you know, cause we can kind of see it in, in our heads because of the handoffs, because of those handoffs, there's a lack of transparency and there's longer timelines then. Whereas with Scrum, you've got these compressed, really short timelines. And then you have this radical transparency every single day talking to each other about what's what's happening, what's not happening. So what tends to happen when you take some of those handoffs away, or you take some of that lead time away, all your impediments are exposed, right? And so, you know, sometimes employers will be like, whoa, 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 things are coming off the rails. The, the, the framework's not working. This is the framework working. The, the framework is doing its job and it's exposing the impediments. And now we can get busy setting an order of how we want to tackle them. And I do see people who have that military background or who understand teamwork, who understand some of those environments, they don't get freaked out like some of their classically trained waterfall uh, counterparts might. It's like, nope, let's make a list. Let's tackle it one at a time. Let's talk to each other. Let's figure this out. Let's adapt together. So. That one was just me. That was in response, a second response to Mike's question, but hey, <laughs> other Angela, questions. Yes, Jeff. I have a, um, a quick question. I've been seeking out, you know, some of these certifications and trains. So uh, many years ago, I was working in manufacturing and I, I was very interested in Six Sigma and mm. I was, I was moving in that direction. Um, but uh, uh, the, the job role and things kind of steered me away and I, I changed to a different company and got into installations. And so I pursued the project manager uh, role and I, I was going after that and I was in an installation for a company that did install security systems. So they were a bunch of promoted technicians, not really project managers. Mm -hmm. So they would not um, uh, assist me in the education of PMP. So I, I was going there and I was helping them with processes and working through that. So I moved from Six Sigma, okay, I'll, I'll go towards PMP. And then I started learning about Agile 
and Scrum. And that really interests me, especially being in the um, security installations. There's a lot of interaction with IT. It helps. Um, but the role that I had was more of a national PM that was working with those local offices. So it was, it was almost like I wasn't on the, in, you know, boots on the ground. I was the guy working with the boots on the ground. They were running it. I was making sure it, they did it the, the way of the customer. So more of a liaison in a sense, uh, managing project managers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why Scrum and Agile uh, really um, interest me, that whole the Scrum, kind of the Agile methodology and the Scrum. So how do I know what to pursue? I, I've now, since I got laid off, I took the PMP class. I haven't gone for the exam. But now I, I keep on trying to decide, do I go after I know, Do I go, right? you know, it's so how thing. do you make those decisions on what you yeah. pursue? Yeah, that's that magic. What do you want to be when you grow up, right? So yeah. what, I, what I ask people is, what, what floats your boat? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Because there are some project management friends of mine where if I would talk about some of the people stuff I was getting involved in, you know, some of the tough conversations that I had to facilitate or navigate through, they're like, oh, no, no, no. I want my charts and graphs. Uh, you want a pivot table? I'm your guy or gal, right? Get, where, where are my Gantt charts? And I'm like, this isn't the job for you. And that doesn't make it bad. It's like the world needs uh, analyticals who can produce those things. Let's find you a, a home that matches those skills. This ain't that. You know, so to be a scrum master, you really have to like get your hands messy and really tune in to the people stuff, which isn't everybody's cup of tea. So I'm talking nonverbals facial expressions, vocal intonation, you know, inflection, that kind of thing. The other role that I haven't talked about is the product owner. So if you do like being in charge, if you like, you know, uh, setting the order, hey, now that I heard all the stuff, that I heard all the data, this makes sense to do first, this makes sense to do second, that's the product owner role. So the product owner owns the budget, owns the scope, owns the timeline, and it's not that they don't take input because product owners take input. They're not benevolent dictators. It's like, nope, I heard all the, the stuff. Here's the best course of action. So the product owner is responsible for ordering who, what, why. The developers on the team are responsible for the how, the building, the implementation, right? So I always ask people, if you, if you really like the people stuff, you don't mind getting your hands messy, Scrum Master might be the home for you. Like being in charge, like taking a bunch of pieces of input and figuring out how to maximize the value of a product, product owner might be more um, uh, the path you want to go down. And there's a couple of your members that I do know um, when they found out that the scrum master was kind of zero deliverables, they even said, you know, I need the stakeholder management piece. That's the one part I miss from project management. I, I, I want that interaction with the stakeholders and letting them know, here's where we're at. Hey, talk to me about what's next. A product owner was a little more the applicable path for that person, right? So it's not always scrum master either, right? So thank you for asking that because it made me go, oh no, wait a minute, we should, we should talk about the product ownership piece. With your Six Sigma background, uh, I think just as a, as a framework, right? As a, I'll grab my scrum picture, as a framework, there's a lot that would resonate with you because um, Six Sigma, honestly, is the, the Western interpretation of TPS, Toyota Production System. And Toyota is very clear that Lean Six Sigma is a set of tools, but what they do is mindset and tools. And so Scrum is mindset and tools. And because they're both rooted in Toyota, the Lean Six Sigma and Scrum, they complement each other very well. So people who have come through that have that appreciation for lean, like you said, customer, customer first, they get it more readily than people who haven't had that background, but you've got choices. You know, do you like to be in charge? Do you like the people stuff? Or are you a doer? You know, do you want to be on the team? Do you want to be on a member of the team building stuff? So you have to come Yeah, on. thank you. I mean, that's exactly where I'm where I'm headed. I, I think I'm headed toward the, the scrum more than anything. If I were to weigh them out, it's just because of that. Um, I love to work with people much more. I mean, the project management is, is great, but you're so bound by the rules and everything. It's like uh, that, that can be very uh, weight heavy on you, you know, at the end of the Friday, you're trying to get out of there. 
you can't. So the other two practical things I would encourage you to look at is um, uh, time and money and marketability. Because when you are in job search mode, letters do not hurt. Do they, Stephen? Where'd Stephen go? <laughs> you know, because recruiters like using their, their um, screeners. And so uh, if, if you're automatically saying, I don't want to even look at the positions where they ask for a PMP, that's, you, know, you have to understand you're making that choice. Because I always tell consultants or people in job search mode, letters never hurt. But now we get to the time and money part. PMP is expensive. It's not only expensive to get, it's expensive to maintain. So like if you look at, um, you know, the cost of my class is almost the total amount of the cost of sitting down for a PMP. It was $435 when I took it. I don't know if anybody more current can tell me, but that was the application fee I had to pay to take the PMP. So it was $435 four hour test and there's no way you could pass it without going to prep classes. So then I had to pay thousands of dollars to go to boot camps and prep classes. And then thank God I passed it on the first time because they make you pay if you fail. They make you pay to take it again. With the CSM, the one thing I appreciate is it's low barrier to entry intentionally. There's no extra cost. There's no hidden fees. If you take the class, you're ready to take the test. It's, it's the pathway to take the test and you get a free do over. So if you bomb it, we give you a mulligan. So it's, you know, so if you're paying attention in class, you're going to pass. So the philosophies are totally different. So I would say, what do you want to be when you grow up, Jeff? Time and money, uh, marketability. So Angela, this is, oh, sorry. This is Mike Warren. I had a question too. I'm on a Kanban team and we support like 20 different teams and projects and they use different tools and they have different sprint times. And is there a better way to coordinate that overall? Or because I know each team is supposed to be able to pick their own tools and what they want to do. Yeah. And by tools, do you mean like software applications? Yeah. And stuff well, like, like Jira that? and. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so a lot of companies will dictate that to teams. Like here, you're okay. using Jira, you're using version one or Rally. Yeah. And when you look at that first value in the manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, <laughs> kind of yeah. contradictory. And, and the thing we have to remember is that the tools companies want you to buy their software. They want you to pay, hopefully indefinitely, for software licenses. And they'll roll out a default uh, style. And if, as a team, we say, that doesn't work for us. We want to you know, um, uh, customize a couple of things in the tool. They'll let you do that for an additional fee. So the mistake I see organizations make is not letting teams figure out the process that's going to work for them first and then select the tool. Um, and most of the times when we've gone in and done assessments, companies already have a tool that would work just fine. Like if you have a SharePoint instance, it does almost everything you can do in JIRA. Now they keep adding on whiz bangs to Jira. So, but most of the product owners that I have the pleasure of no longer serving, just use like an ordered SharePoint list. You can subscribe to it, get notifications. It integrates with the team's uh, software tools. So really, if we get right down to the values and principles, Mike, we would let the people decide, but we don't have the luxury of that sometimes. You know, leaders in the organization will declare things like, we're going agile. So they'll implement a tool and say, make this work. I don't know if I'm helping or just giving you a, a, a dose of the reality no, out yeah, there. Okay. That's kind of kind of good that way. It's it keeps it easier on the support teams where we don't have to learn, you know, we can't learn five different tools because it doesn't make sense. Okay. It doesn't, right? It's yeah. just like there's so much, you know, duplication of effort and this is supposed yeah. to make us more efficient. Okay. Right? Yeah. I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the, the reason that I love uh, owning my own company, Sheila, is we, we take GI Bill. We, we figure it out. We do the paperwork. We're, we're not opposed to doing that. I know Alan's giving me the big thumbs up. We try to make it really easy too. So we try to keep it streamlined. We also do discounts for Eagle member groups, uh, your, all your members, all the veterans. So that Mike has taken advantage of that. Alan has taken advantage of that. So, and Alan, you can shamelessly share my 
contact information because like I said, I'm happy to hop on calls one-on-one -on -one with anybody. Our organization will accept GI Bill. Yep. Other questions? Uh, Angela, Michelle. I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, really clarify things that could be complex otherwise. Um, and I really appreciate your speaking with us tonight. I have a question that comes from a different position. What advice might you give someone who's never worked on an agile team and maybe ends up in a new job and then they're told, hey, this is awesome. You're going to end up on this agile team. They have no idea. What, were, what would be a couple tips that you might give someone to succeed at the start as they're learning? That's a great question. Um, ask a lot of questions ask a lot of questions. And the fun thing about being new, you can play that new kid card. This might be a dumb question, but I'm just going to ask. And you have no idea how much that helps other people because they, they may have made an assumption or fallen into a rut or not even known, right? So it's like, I'm new here. So I want to ask a couple of things. So ask questions before telling. So question before speaking, observations before speaking. Right, I, I really see some people make a mistake where they kind of go in guns blazing or and it may not be from bad intentions. It may be, you know, enthusiasm, wh whatever the case is, but kind of get the lay of the land, you know, observe a little bit, hear some things, make some observations, and then you'll be able to craft your questions more effectively as opposed to making assumptions. And I always assume positive intent. I'm not perfect at it. I work my tail off at it every single day, but I try really hard to assume positive intent, you know, gather some of that data before passing judgments. As we like to say in our team, your ego is not your amigo. So if your ego starts telling you something that may not be true, um, one of the things we do to each other here is we'll say, what story are you telling yourself right now? Right? What, what story are you telling yourself right now? So, <laughs> so that's helpful. That would be my three quick tips for you. Well, Angela. Yes. Uh, my name is Floyd Goodwin. Uh, pleasure meeting you, by the way. Nice to um, meet you. Lots of good information. Uh, have you ever had an incident, uh, incident when uh, the culture actually cancels out the, um, the effectiveness of a Scrum platform? Yes. The short answer is yes, all the time. <laughs> we like to call it the organizational antibodies, right? Treat Scrum like a virus and the organizational antibodies that fear change kill it. <laughs> so, so that's a big one, Floyd. That's a big so, one. So when you uh, when we're talking about the people aspect of uh, of Scrum, um, I, in the past, uh, I think uh, even when Jeff was mentioning something about project management, um, one of the things that I've always taken upon myself uh, as a project manager is to um, learn the chemistry of what I'm actually working with. And mm -hmm. once you identify even what you're working with, identify the parts of the equation that also fails on a, on a daily basis and learn that aspect of it, uh, always incorporating kind of a spinner in the, uh, in the mix. Somebody who actually wants to learn uh, two or three things as compared to joint, being specializing in just one in yep. order for a project to not lose traction in regards to you know completing it or delivering the, the value of it. Right. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I like to point out when I say people skills, people skills, people skills. It's not just the people on the team. I like I like your term, I wrote it down. I'm gonna steal that spinner. <laughs> Cause we say, you know, T-shaped skills as opposed to I shape where, you know, I shaped folks just say me, 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 this is the one thing I do. Whereas a T-shape would do exactly what Floyd was talking about saying, hey, I do have this skill that I bring to the table, but I'm willing to learn. So my phrase that I like to use in organizations is can't lives on won't street. It's not that you can't, you either don't know how yet, or you don't want to. And as a scrum master, I get real specific with my questions because a lot of the things that we're talking about in the world of work do not defy the laws of physics. So it's like, are you telling me you don't know how yet, or are you telling me you don't want to? And I wait for an honest answer. And if somebody says, well, I don't want to. Well, that's a people problem. That is not a scrum problem. And so we have to escalate to whatever level is appropriate in the organization if we have exhausted our people tricks or our people skills. But if somebody says, you know, 
I don't know how yet, but I am willing to learn. Great. How do you want to learn? Do you want to pair with somebody? Hey, Floyd, are you willing to pair with this person so that they can get up to speed on this? Because I, that's how we, that's how we learn. But then in coaching leaders, that's also the scrum master's job. That if it's people or process, it's scrum master. If it's, you know, the scope budget timeline, it's product owner, right? So if it's anything to do with the product, it's product owner, but the scrum master is people in process. So as a scrum master, I've had to do that. I've had to go to a manager and say, hey, you know, Mike here on your team. Yeah, he doesn't want to, doesn't want to play well with others, doesn't want to help uh, his teammates out, doesn't want to learn anything new. Not that would, that would ever happen, right, Mike? So you have to, you know, escalate to the right level of leadership to tackle that problem. And I appreciate leaders who set the tone. I mentioned my friends at Novatech, they set the tone. Their leaders said, we're doing this. So if you want to learn new things, you can stay. And if you're not willing to learn, we will introduce you to the competition. So the CEO of Microsoft says that. He goes, we're, we don't want know-it-alls. We want learn-it-alls. So we have to kind of make those choices. So I love where your head's at with the, the Spinner uh, concept. Was there a follow-up, Floyd, or did I answer it? Because I can't see your face, but I wanted to- No, you didn't. You answered my question. Because um, awesome. I think in more ways than one, these days we do run into, you know, old mannerisms are kind of mm -hmm. hard to break. Big time. Uh, especially when you're bringing in something uh, new like Scrum, the sprint uh, value of, of it. But if a company's used to doing things uh, a certain way and- you're bringing in something new like this. Uh, sometimes um, egos, old mannerisms become uh, hurdles that uh, slows down the process or the effectiveness of a scrum platform. Totally, totally. Thank you for bringing that up because that, that's kind of my life. <laughs> you know, when I'm coaching these organizations, that's the part that I get sucked into is all the organizational stuff there. <laughs> You know, Angela, one of the most attractive things to me on the Scrum side of things is the retrospective portion of that, because mm -hmm. as a project manager, when I see things that could do better, and I'm so passionate about continuous improvement, it takes forever to change process and project management. It mm -hmm. has to go through so many loopholes where I love the way that Scrum has retrospective right there at the end. You take it and you're supposed to, am I, am I correct in saying you're supposed to apply that to the mm -hmm. next? That is uh, correct. Screen? So I, I think that that's so attractive to me. Yep. And that is, that is uh, totally true. First of all, so validating your, your thought there, because it's one, no more than two immediate process improvements. So it's like, Hey, we're not trying to boil the ocean and remember rules of good troubleshooting. You know, you don't flip 12 levers on something because then you don't see what effect the change had. So it's, it's one no more than two immediate process improvements. And then exactly what you said, there's another retro right at the end of this sprint. So then they have an opportunity to say, hold on, did that change we just made make it better or did it make it worse? Because if it made it worse, let's try something else. But if it made it better, yay, it's a permanent part of our process. Let's move on to what's next. So that's the other aspect of it, right? You don't have to necessarily keep it. It's these small little experiments. Thanks. If it didn't work, oh, well, let's stop doing it. Yep. Good stuff. They started off slow, Alan, but they're they're coming on strong with the questions. Good. Good. Well, you know, you said <laughs> the magic words. Angela? With you. <laughs> Angela? Yeah. I have another question for you, sure, then. Floyd. Mm -hmm. Um. So Scrum, the Scrum platform, um, does it eliminate legacy? What do you mean by legacy? Like when you keep something around because what if, as compared to saying, this is what I need now to add value to a project to move forward? Yeah, it's not really, you know, because it's so contextual. So it's like, what is the product? And people will say, well, what do you mean by product? No, no, no. You have to define that. So, you know, Scrum's just a framework. It's not, it's not software. It's not a solution. It's not anything, you know, tangible. It's, it's a set of guidelines. It's, you know, here's some roles, here's some rules, right? Here's some events to follow. So really it's, it's whatever's the good of the product. So if you guys think about products, you're all consumers, you guys buy stuff, right? You got, I don't know, you got one of these, you got a phone, it's got airtime, it's got service. Has a product ever been rendered obsolete on you? 
Yeah, because my 2006 Blackberry Pearl, I can't even get anymore, right? So it's really up to an organization or really up to whoever's driving the decisions behind that product. In Scrum, we would call that person product owner to say, nope, we are no longer offering support on this thing. It's duct taped together. There's something new we're going to move on to. So sorry, customers, we're not taking uh, your calls on this. We're not taking your support on it because we want you to cut over to the new baby. But if the product is persisting, hey, we're still taking people's money. We're still taking support calls on it. That feedback loop just comes back to the people who built it. So from a solutioning perspective, right, because you did use the word platform, right? If there was some aspect of the product solution, that's the, the team of developers who's, you know, building the product. They get to decide the best possible solution. And if the best possible solution is moving on to a new technology solution, we'll do that. But it's all, you know, the, the scrum team, product owner, scrum master developers that are coming up with that. And did I understand what you meant by legacy there or platform? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Because that could have gone a couple of ways. Yeah, this is Mike. I know legacy always, we still have a couple of teams that still do waterfall or whatever too. So not everybody's converted yet or so. Well, and we're in the land here in Minneapolis of big financial institutions and big insurance companies. And a lot of big financial institutions and insurance companies um, are on mainframe. A lot of them, I mean, whether they want to admit it or not, are <laughs> trying to get off green screen. And one of the mistakes I see them making is they're coming at replacing those old platforms the same way that they built them. And it, what they don't understand is they're going to be in the exact same position five, 10 years from now. Because you'll say, why are you uh, changing your platform? Well, the vendor's not supporting it anymore. It's being sunsetted. It's being rendered obsolete. So if you look at the, the big companies, like we were talking about Amazon, you know, the big news flash today that, you know, Jeff's stepping down as a CEO. The, the companies that were born in the age of agile that weren't born in the waterfall age, they don't architect that way. So they don't think about, you know, horizontal layers, like here's my platform and it's one platform to rule them all, right? With all the applications, they build that architecture, they build that hardware, they build the foundation in vertical slices. And then they have those vertical slices of functionality talk to each other through interfaces. That way, if there's a problem, they can decouple just the, the vertical that's in question, the troublemaker, and keep everything else running. That's the way, you know, the kids that were born in the age of Agile are thinking about architecture and whatnot. But you say that to some of these uh, classically trained enterprise architects or hardcore waterfall teams and they just look at you like it got three heads. So it, it, is, a, it is a paradigm change. Structure just change, behavior change. Yeah, just because it's mainframe doesn't mean it has to be waterfall either. Totally. So. Totally. I mean, there was a financial uh, services company that I worked with on the East Coast uh, back when I was traveling, you know, when we were allowed to do such things. But this is many years ago now. It's like 10 years ago. Um, but we had just this amazing team that I worked with in North Carolina, and they were trying to move from mainframe uh, to something more current. But here you had mainframe folks, uh, Java developers, people formerly known as testers and analysts, cats and dogs living together all on this one scrum team cross-training each other. And people were like, how are you doing this? It's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm getting out of their way, but I'm enabling them to talk to each other. And, you know, it, they just, they didn't have any ego in it or, you know, they, they would say, you know, uh, if I learned a mainframe, I, I guess I could learn Java. Are you willing to teach me, Mike? You know, so they, they were doing all the right people things because as somebody who used to code in antiquated languages, if I can learn it, anybody can. You know, it's, it's just like learning a different spoken language. You know, like learning French or German. Good questions. Other stuff. Alan blasted my contact info. I saw that. <laughs> so yes, yes, yes. Happily get in touch with folks. I I uh -oh. can say from very open answering questions, like the email or something, if you've got like, oh, a, yeah. I don't understand or 
is there a video on this? Um, she's always forthcoming. So thank you for that, Angela. Yep. No problem. Even if it's not mine, right? I sent, <laughs> right. You, I sent you all of MJ's videos. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Other final comments, final thoughts, final questions? Interesting, helpful, nice, good, good. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, you won't hurt my feelings if you say no, it's all boring <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well then I guess Thank I you. will run and head home and see if they made me dinner. Thanks for doing this, Angela. Thanks for hosting it. me, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Angela, mm -hmm. in yes, closing, please. I have one more question. Oh, sure. My, yes. and my apologies for being the, uh, the last part of this, but um, Scrum, as you know it, uh, as you understand it, as you breathe it, do you look at it as being a repackaging of something else that we already have in place? Just curious. Not really. Um, if I if I had to, it would be mm. Toyota way, and I don't necessarily mean Lean Six Sigma. I mean TPS, right? Because it's all about customer first, working together. That's the way my eight year old tells uh, people, Floyd, when they say, "What do you? What does your mom do?" He says, "You know, she teaches people to work together." really you know it's 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 really simple stuff it's ordered to-do lists talking to each other and working together so no i don't really see it repackaged as anything else but. okay thank you yeah all right all right thanks everyone thanks for having me thanks alan for what? making this all happen good night you know we're here each week Tip awesome well anytime <laughs> you want me back yeah you just let me know sounds good thanks angela thanks